Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a nice uh, break and an opportunity to maybe grab a coffee or tea or water or whatever you prefer. Um, we are going to uh, continue this wonderful session with a second uh, panel. And at this time, we will have two colleagues from the European institutions. My name is Alina Sekara. Um, I represent the University of Vienna, which is one of the co-organizers of this event. I am a white woman in my late 30s. I have diamond-shaped face, wear black rimmed glasses, have short hair, and today I'm wearing a light uh, blue blouse. So we, we have two very um, exciting colleagues, one from the parliament and one from the commission. And they're going to tell us about their experience in, um, in the world of accessibility and audiovisual translation. And we are going to start with Helen Dobie, who works at the European Commission in Brussels in the Directorate General, uh, General for Communication. Her current role is in Web Accessibility Coordinator in the Europa Web Team Unit. This is the team responsible for the European Commission's main website. She moved to commission from London back in 2010 to work as a translator and also worked as a web editor before, before joining DG Communication in 2017. Since 2019, she has been working on coordinating the work to improve the accessibility of the Commission's web presence for people with disabilities, working together with colleagues in other departments. Um, her talk today is about accessibility in the European Commission, and I'm going to let Helen introduce us to, uh, to this topic um, at, uh, at the Commission. Thank you, Helen, the floor is yours. Thanks, Alina. Do you see my screen? I hope so, anyway. Um, okay, so um, my name's Helen Dobby, and I work in the European Commission in the Communication Directorate, DGCOM, as Alina said. I'm a woman in my mid 40s uh, with long dark hair and a ponytail, and I'm wearing a navy blue dress and glasses. So yeah, I work in the unit that's responsible for the Commission's main website, um, ec.europa.eu, and we work on bringing consistency to the Commission's overall web presence. And my specific role is accessibility coordinator. And that means I work on various projects to improve the accessibility of the Commission's online tools and websites, especially for people with disabilities. So in my talk today, um, I'm going to talk about what accessibility is and why it's important and a quick look at some of the legal aspects and then tell you what we're doing in the Commission uh, to improve the accessibility of our websites. So yeah, what is accessibility or uh, well, web accessibility? Web accessibility refers essentially to making our websites accessible to people with the widest range of capabilities. So it's about making sure that as many people as possible can access understand and use the digital content that we put online. Now, there is a tendency to see web accessibility as just a checklist of rules or a box ticking exercise in meeting legal requirements. But I think it's helpful to remember that accessibility is really about people and it's about how people with disabilities use the web. So as a public sector organization, the commission has a duty to remove as many barriers as possible from people accessing our content online. And I think it comes down to whether we see people with disabilities or anyone who is different from us in any way as our equals or not. 
we have to remember that the choices that we make can affect how people are able to interact with our websites. So what else does um, accessibility matter? It, what I say to people at the Commission usually is that it's partly just common sense. If you are publishing information, you want as many people as possible to be able to understand and perceive and interact with the information. And so therefore it needs to be accessible. So here's a, uh, an example um, of that, um, of how poor accessibility online can affect users. So this is an online form um, for reporting a breach of EU law. So EU resident citizens can report a problem with EU law. And when the web team that uh, published this form or had this form online ran a survey to test the form and see what people thought of it, they received a lot of complaints from blind users who said they were unable to complete the form. Um, so, at the time, we asked a colleague of ours at the European Parliament, uh, Tanya, who's an accessibility expert and who is also blind and uses a screen reader, to test the form and see what she thought of it. And she said that although the form itself was perfectly accessible, the problem was uh, that at the end of the form, there was a piece of software called a capture or a little puzzle for people to complete that she was unable to, to finish, to do. So she tried several times to fill in um, the capture and wasn't able to, to manage it. And so this is something that would block not only users with a vision impairment, but it might be blocking to somebody with dyslexia, for example, also. And the solution that the team, the web team first thought of um, when they encountered this problem was to tell this, the, the users, well, why don't you just go to the representation and drop your form off, the local EU representation in your country and drop your form off there. And so I asked Tanya to help explain why this is not an acceptable response and, and what would be better. So basically it would mean that while some users would be able to fill in the form on a Sunday afternoon at home in their pajamas and their living room, um, we would be forcing other users like Tanya, um, who may have a disability, to take a taxi on a weekday into town, into a major city and report this breach of law in person. And Tanya actually said, as part of her feedback, she said, this really feels like discrimination. And how would I even know that the other person at the representation had transcribed my pro problem exactly as I described it? So we know that around one in five people in the EU, EU has a long-term illness or impairment or disability. And clearly, we don't want to exclude all these people. So web accessibility encompasses all the types of disability that may affect your ability to access the web, including auditory, cognitive, neurological, physical and speech disabilities. So we need to make sure that everything we create is accessible to everyone, regardless of whether they have impairments or not, or maybe a combination of different impairments. And web accessibility actually also benefits people without disabilities. So to demonstrate this, um, Microsoft have this really cool tool called the Inclusive Toolkit. And it has a persona spectrum showing you that disabilities can range from being permanent to temporary or just situational. So for example, here you have on screen three little people um, representing a user who is blind, one who may have cataracts, and the third who is a distracted driver. And all of these may be interacting with your website using a screen reader or voice recognition software, for example. And here you have um, three different users uh, on screen, little stick people again, um, one who has one arm, one who has injured their arm, perhaps broken it, and somebody else who is a new parent holding a baby. 
And all these people may be interacting with your website using only a keyboard. They may not be able to use their mouse, for example. So it's about bearing all of these people in mind. And lastly, case studies have shown that accessible websites perform much better in search results. They are much cheaper and easier to maintain, and they have an increased audience reach. So you're probably familiar um, with this quite famous quotation. It's from Tim Berners-Lee, inventor of the World Wide Web, and he said this back in 1997. And he said that the power of the web is its universality. So access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect. We have to remember that this is not automatic. We have to be careful that all the content we create and publish does not put up barriers for people. So accessibility is not just the right thing to do, it's also the law for public sector websites in the EU now. This is the Web Accessibility Directive. Uh, it came into force in 2016, so if you've noticed more people talking about accessibility, this is partly why, it's one of the reasons. And the Web Accessibility Directive requires EU public sector websites to meet certain standards. Um, for example, they need to comply with the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or the WCAG, um, version 2.1 at the moment, and level AA. Uh, they should have an accessibility statement online explaining when you last audited the site, um, what features are accessible, listing any features that may not be accessible and explaining how you plan to fix those. And lastly, inside the statement, there should also be a feedback mechanism. So a way for users to contact you perhaps by email or phone and request content in alternative formats that are accessible to them or to make a complaint about inaccessible content. So we understand that web accessibility is essential if we want to create high quality websites and not exclude anybody from using them. So what are we doing in the Commission to put all this into practice? Well, first of all, um, we always follow our design principles and two of those key design principles when building websites are users first. So people must be able to navigate our sites easily. And the second rule is that we should always be inclusive. So we strive to make the content accessible to people with disabilities and welcoming to as many people as possible. Now, like many public sector organisations or large governmental organisations across the EU, we have a vast landscape in the European Commission of websites hundreds of websites, um, over 800 the last time they counted. And our role in the team I work in is to bring order and coherence to this ecosystem. And one way we've tried to achieve this is by redesigning the main commission website. The goal was to streamline it to better meet user needs, um, to make the platform it's published on more accessible. And it also has a navigation structure that was designed based on a survey of over 100,000 users around the world. So they had a lot of feedback um, on usability for the design. Now this main website serves as a hub and then links to the other several hundred websites that the Commission owns. And it has a user-friendly design, as I said, and offers many accessible features as standard. So, for example, you can zoom on text, you can make text much larger, up to 500%, without compromising the layout. So that means you can zoom in and you won't have to scroll from side to side, left to right, 
to read a paragraph, um, the, the page is responsive. The site is also designed to be fully keyboard operable. And so that means you can navigate the site, as I was saying earlier, using only your keyboard and not the mouse. And you would do that by you go to the web address, you click the tab button, and then you should be able to tab through the different options that you could select the links and pages. They'll be highlighted in yellow. So it's clear um, which option is highlighted. And there's also on every page this skip to main content button. And that helps users who are using the keyboard to navigate to skip the top layer of navigation. So here, the search bar, um, the language selector, and uh, the home button, etc. So they don't have to repeatedly hear the same things. And it, the design also uh, has been designed with accessibility in mind. So the color scheme um, was chosen for reasons of accessibility to people who have a color vision deficiency. The fonts, um, are, the font used is a sans serif font. So it's easier for people with dyslexia, for example, to read. And this main website has about 5 million visitors a month. And it was on this hub back in March um, 2020, in the height of the pandemic that we were able to launch a dedicated coronavirus website that was updated every day in 24 languages. But how do we make sure then that we meet our user needs across all the hundreds of other websites? Well, one way we do this is through guidelines and standards. We have a very detailed uh, online governance manual, the Europa Web Guide. This is the rule book for anybody working on our websites and has lots of guidance on design and usability, but also accessibility. And we've also increased the level of monitoring we do of websites. So last year we audited around 34 websites, new and revamped websites for accessibility with an external accessibility expert. And we also have a series of technical tools to make it easier for uh, colleagues and um, website owners to stick to the rules. So we've developed a brand new web publishing platform that enables users to, well, site owners or to build a website very quickly that is accessible. Um, and this platform is gonna host over a hundred websites when it's finished. Um, and it contains out of the box solutions for building high quality websites that comply with all of the guidelines, not just um, the accessibility ones. And as I mentioned, it was using this platform that we were able to build the coronavirus um, website in just three days at the height of the pandemic um, last year. And we also offer a library of design components. So these are individual components like buttons and lists and filters and so on that the directorates or departments can use to build their sites and that are also fully tested for accessibility. But uh, as you can see from this um, man in red at the foot of a very, very tall mountain, um, we know there's still a lot of work to do. So let me just tell you quickly about some of the work we have upcoming in 2021. We have just set up a task force um, in our directorate for communication, but working with other departments in the commission who have a stake in accessibility or work on the policy or legal side of it. And we plan from that network to build up a commission wide network of accessibility correspondence to raise awareness and um, help move the plans forward. We're also developing an action plan that will be published multi-annual for about four years, which will be publicly available online so people can see what we're doing. There are the web, um, Europa Web Guide, the web accessibility guidelines will be extended in those. We will add checklists for designers and um, developers, writers and so on, and explain how you can test your site. We'll also step up the monitoring, um, we mainly monitoring with an accessibility expert at the moment, but we will also introduce um, 
automated monitoring to catch some of the easy errors that we, that we can fix ourselves without uh, needing an expert. And the most crucial thing is that we will explain how the departments can write their statements, test the site to make a statement and um, what kind of feedback mechanism they need to put in place. Um, and we also see a, a big need for training across the organisation because everybody can really make a difference with accessibility, not just of websites, but also the documents that end up on websites. Um, so we're proposing a training plan on, on accessibility for staff. Um, so I see I'm running a bit short of time. So um, finally, I would just like to leave you um, with this thought that uh, comes up quite a lot when I'm working with people, uh, website owners and explaining accessibility requirements. Um, so maybe if people ever say this to you, sometimes they will say, well, um, you know, this website is only for experts, or it's only for journalists or scientists, um, or we don't have much time. So we really don't need to bother with accessibility. And um, for these situations, I mention um, this lady on screen, Harbin Gimma, and she's a um, Harvard Law graduate, an international disability rights lawyer, um, advocate for accessibility, and she's also deaf and blind. So I remind people that if we build an accessible website, we are also excluding people like Harbin. And it's just a gentle reminder that um, experts can also be people with disabilities or people with disabilities that can also very well be experts. And, um, so yes, yeah, she says, uh, Harbin, we all face the choice to tolerate oppression or advocate for justice and our decisions shape our community. And she asks, do you add captions, image descriptions to photos or consider accessibility for people who are different from you? And so here's the quote from Harbin that I would really like to leave you with. Um, she says, we should all commit to inclusion and role model it for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Great way to, uh, to finish and quite, um, you know, quite a different topic um, to you know, uh, some of us or some of our uh, participants, this this may be uh, may be new. Um, I would like to remind the the participants to please use the Q and A uh, section at the bottom of the screen if you have any questions. Um, and if we don't have time to um, <clears throat> to address those questions during the session, I'm sure all the speakers would be very happy to to provide answers in in the chat um, in the chat area. Um, I just have one uh, one question for for you, Helen. Given that you were a translator, so you you are coming from a from a um, languages background. Um, what are the tips that you would give uh, translators, translator trainees, or, or graduates who would like to to get into the field of web accessibility? What are the things that they should be looking for? What kind of skills they should be um, training up to? I think there are a few things that translators uh, can really do to help um, make web content more accessible and that they can always bear in mind when, when writing. Uh, plain language is the first to use simple, clear language because that's easier, first of all, to translate, but also for screen readers to read and so on. Um, a common thing is how you write um, hyperlinks. So the hyperlinks should really make sense completely out of context. So if you list them all on a page without the text, they should be meaningful in themselves. So they should never say click here or learn more. Um, they should say register for the, um, on the translation event, something like this instead. Um, what else? Yes, uh, um, I think those are the main things, the, the clarity really, um, image captions and, and uh, alt text and so on is also very important. Um, okay, yeah. thank you very, very much. Um, and I'm sure there'll be, uh, there'll be questions. I already see that. Um, um, there are already comments in the in the Q and A um, area, um, so we will move now to to the European Parliament uh, to to hear about the audiovisual um, 
experience of the Lux Audience Award. And our next speaker is Jana Bumer uh, Shuverova, who's been working in the European Parliament since 2007. Currently, she works as an intercultural and language professional in the My House of European History Unit of the Citizens Language Directorate, where she translates, adapts, transcreates, and revises different types of content in text, audio, and video formats. So already quite a, uh, quite a big list of, of things that, uh, that Jana is doing. Uh, before joining the newly created Citizens Language Directorate in 2020, she had spent 13 years as a translator, terminologist, and trainee supervisor at the Slovak Translation Unit of the Directorate of Translation. So we're looking forward to, to hearing more about the Lux Audience um, Award. The floor is yours, Jana. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. Hello, my name is Jana Bumer Šuverova. I've just turned 40 this year. I'm Slovak. I have white skin. My eyes are green. I have straight kind of rusty colored hair tied up in a ponytail. And today I'm wearing the hanging earrings in the form of cherry and uh, dark gray turtleneck just to cover the red spots caused by the huge stage fright I have. <laughs> so why am, I, why am I here today to talk to you? I want to share with you the unique experience of subtitling uh, the Lux Audience Award films. I said unique. Um, it was unique for me because I have never ever done something like that before. I had all the skills needed, uh, but I wasn't using them, of course. Luckily, thanks to these, let's call them transferable skills, in combination with the professional training and support by the whole Directorate General for Translation, at some point, I felt I am prepared to do this job. So let's have a look at my presentation. I'm going to share my screen and start the presentation now. So I will talk about my experience, as you can see it in the title. But of course, it wasn't only about me. We were a team. We were a team of Slovak translators, but also there was a technical team, teams of translators of all other 23 languages. And of course, it was a joint effort, not only of our directorate, Directorate D, but of the whole Directorate General for translation. Let's have a look now at my place where I am in this big structure, where you can find me. So I have joined European Parliament in 2007. I have always been working at the Directorate General for Translation. That is actually world leader in translation, covering all 24 official EU languages. Directorate General for Translation consists of uh, four directorates. Previously, I worked at Directorate B, at the Slovak Translation Unit, uh, which deals mostly with translations of legislative and parliamentary texts or with terminology. However, in 2020, I accepted the challenge to join the newly created Directorate D. So what is hidden under the name of Directorate D? Directorate D is also called Directorate for Citizens Language. It is composed of five units, as you can see, clear language and editing unit, audio and podcast unit, subtitling and voiceover unit, my House of European History Unit and Speech to Text Unit. These units consist of cross unit pool of intercultural language professionals and proofreaders or language editors who are responsible for all linguistic tasks in 24 languages. Our main goal is clear communication and we pursue that in three formats. 
text, audio and video. As Slovak, I am formerly part of a great team in the My House of European History Unit. This unit gathers personal stories related to the European history, and these stories are told by people from all over of our continent. Well, but now I believe you would like to hear about the main topic of my presentation, which is the Lux Audience Award. So what is actually the Lux Audience Award? This new award is presented by the European Parliament and the European Film Academy in partnership with the European Commission and Europa Cinema. Its predecessor was Lux Prize, established actually in the same year as I joined the Parliament in 2007. So why this change of the name from Lux Prize to Lux Audience Award? This new prize wants to strengthen ties between politics and citizens. Very important is that now also the public is invited to vote for the nominees, not only members of the European Parliament. And by the way, the winner of the Lux Audience Award for this year is going to be announced next week on Wednesday uh, by President of the European Parliament, David Maria Sassoli in Strasbourg during the plenary session, which, which takes place once a month in Strasbourg. Um, for my presentation, I chose to talk to you in particular only about one of these films, about these three films. You can see here the images of the Oscar winning Druck or Another Round by Thomas Winterberg. Uh, the Oscar nominee documentary called Collective by Alexander Nano, and also another film nominated for Oscar called Bože Ciao or Corpus Christi by Jan Komasa. And since I have been learning Polish now for, for a few years, you can guess which one I chose for you. But first, let's talk about the preparation because you heard that I have never done something like that before. So it was a huge challenge, a huge task, task. Luckily, as I mentioned, we got a professional training. This training was language agnostic one, language specific one, which was done in the Slovak case by Ms. Perez and technical one, which related to the working tool, which we used for translating subtitles. Um, then a second stage, there was something called dry run, which was something like a mock test. We tried to subtitle a trailer from, from the Slovene movie called Class Enemy, which was in 2014 nominated uh, for the Lux Prize Award. Uh, then there is a very important part of preparation. Uh, it was part also of the dry run, but also an integral part of preparation for every single film. It's called collation. So you may ask, what is a collation? Uh, it's actually a meeting organized by the people who are native speakers of the language of the film. These people did research and then they presented the results to us. They presented our informa us information about the film, about the director, actors, background of the film, also about the plot and characters. But not only this, they informed us also about particularities regarding the language used in the movie, about the songs, cultural and other references. Very important part were annotations. Uh, we got the annotations already before the collation. And since we had chance or we were, we, we were supposed to watch the movie before the collation, uh, in the collation, we were able to raise questions to ask about different parts of the movie, which were maybe not clear to us. And we could also kind of revise the template 
And what I want to highlight here uh, regarding the preparation and the decollation. Um, actually, our service, the service of translation in the Directorate General for Translation is the only one offering a harmonized approach to subtitles across all 24 languages. And this is also thanks to the collation, to the collective collations, where we decide collectively also about how to interpret certain parts of the movie. So our interpretation is the same in all 24 languages. And as far as I know, this doesn't exist elsewhere in the world. But how did the actual workflow look like? Let's have a look at it. First, there was the template, which was prepared by the technical team. Technical team, these are people working with the languages, but not translating the subtitles. Um, they are always helped by the native speakers of the film. If it was a Slovak film, of course, it, they would be helped by Slovak translators, Slovak uh, linguists. After the template is finished, it goes to the translator, to the subtitler, and it's subtitled. Uh, this is a long process, which is done only by one person for each language. So when I finished my subtitles, I send them with all my comments and questions to the reviser. Reviser was a colleague of mine, also a native speaker, and it was also only one single person. This whole process was not a one-way process. It was quite a complex one, and it, it consisted not only about uh, exchanging comments, but also about of exchanging emails, in my case, even phone calls at night and so on. Um, after the revision, the final revision was done, um, the subtitles went again to the technical team for technical review. And there was now only one person responsible for a technical review. Um, that meant actually that this person could insert comments, raise questions or queries and address them to the subtitler, to the subtitler or also to the reviser. And of course the subtitlers and the revisers um, were obliged to answer the questions and to solve the problems which, which, raised, which were raised. At the final stage, something called spectators review came. This was done again uh, by a Slovak, Slovak colleague. Uh, this colleague watched the whole movie with our subtitles without having any information about the movie. And um, this person actually watched the movie as a normal viewer would see it, would watch it in the cinema. So that, that the whole process, this whole workflow was happening in 24 languages plus four dual streams for bilingual countries like Belgium, Finland, Ireland, Luxembourg and screenings in the European Parliament. So I mentioned that we had also a technical training um, uh, related to the working tool. Our working tool was called Plint. Here you can see a screenshot of how it looks like when we translate, when we subtitle in uh, Plint. It's an integral platform with video of the film in the middle. And on the left, there is place for comments, comments to the reviser, but also comments to the technical team. And then also comments, uh, also place for annotations. Uh, below, there is a window with the English template. I maybe forgot to mention that we have one template, the English template for all the 23 languages. Then next to, next to that is the window where we insert our translation. Uh, we have there also all the useful indicators we need regarding the speed, characters count, and so on. 
But now let's move to the movie itself. Corpus Christi or Bože Ciao by Jan Komasa. This film is much about religion with a lot of religious terminology. And this terminology had to be researched. And also in the survey, in the translator's survey, um, it has been said that religious references uh, were actually considered as the most difficult elements of the subtitling process. For me personally, however, this film was also very much about the dilemma between staying closer to the Polish original or sticking to the English template, as well as about cultural references and language register. Let's have a look at four separate groups of interesting elements, which I chose. First group is prayers, the prayers. It was very interesting indeed to hear the prayers because they were not only church prayers or prayers told in front of a shrine, but they were also told by the prisoner, by the main character, Daniel, who was paraphrasing them in a quite informal way. Uh, so it was not only about religious language, but also about religious language used by different users. Another very interesting field were profanities. So I must admit that for me, this was the first time I had to deal with profanities or swear words in translation. And on top of that came the fact that the amount of swear words <laughs> in this film was simply striking. Uh, so there is quite a difference between Slovak and Polish language in this sense. Me and my revisor, we, we had to ask ourselves, how much can we actually write down in subtitles? We, we really needed to reduce the swear words or translate them with other terms. Of course, sometimes we had to use them, as you can see also on this image. And this leads me to my next point, which is the slang. Slang was spoken by different people, by the youngsters, as well as by the prisoners. Uh, we questioned ourselves how far to go so that our translation is not perceived as a grammar or spelling mistake, but as our intention. Here you can also see an example of an annotation explaining to us what's actually stado. And actually, I find this annotation a bit uh, funny because it looks as if the convicts were there to discuss some business matters, maybe settle an argument would fit better. But you see, even though clear communication and clear language is ma our main goal, uh, sometimes also we, we forget about it. Uh, now let's move to the last group of specific elements in the movie. It's the songs. In this movie, there was a whole variety of songs. A rap song, um, a snippet of which you can actually also see here, which was very different from the folk song, for example, which was again very different from the religious song. And we, we really had to decide on the linguistic means which with, on the linguistic means to choose in order to make the songs sound folkloric or religious. So if it, it was quite uh, tempting and interesting. And we also um, had to think a lot about the similarity between the Slovak and Polish language. Wouldn't the Slovak viewer perceive it as a contradiction if he hear, hears and understands one thing and sees another written on the screen? So sometimes we may be um, left out the rhymes and put in 
a word which just matched with the Polish sound, especially as regards the songs. Well, this brings me to the end of my presentation. And as you might remember, um, my job profile is called intercultural and language professional. So you might ask, what is that I need to be able to fulfill all my tasks? What does the today's world of translation need? Well, in my opinion, we need expert language professionals able to translate text, audio, and video formats. We need language professionals who don't have only solid translation skills, because one of the most important skills in my view, a skill of today's translator is open-mindedness. On the top of that comes the ability to learn by themselves. And also the ability to look for answers, to look for answers online, but also offline, and to look for answers which are already provided, which are somewhere, you only have to find them. Also, you must be curious about everything and you must really go outside what is expected from the translator's role. Last but not least comes for me, the passion. Passion for your job, passion for everything you do. So thank you for listening. And now if there are any questions, I would be pleased to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Jana. Uh, that was perfect, uh, perfect timing, um, timing as well. Um, it was um, really exciting to see here live an example of something that Jorge was mentioning before, this idea of working from a template, but also working from a pivot language. So my question um, here is, because you were working from an English template, but you also had knowledge, you also had Polish knowledge. So in a way you are privileged there. Um, do you think that you, your task would have been uh, very different or maybe impossible um, if you were not to have Polish knowledge and only uh, to work from the English template? Thank you for your question, Alina. Uh, well, you were right. Uh, my role was maybe easier as the role of uh, translators who don't understand Polish. Um, and since I translated also subtitles for the Danish movie, Druk, I know that there is a difference. Of course there is. Um, but I wouldn't say that uh, it wouldn't be possible for me to, to translate it or to, to do a the same good job in case of a movie which language I don't understand or don't speak. And this is also um, because we had the script to the movie. So um, sometimes you are able to, to search for things you don't understand and, and you think that they might help you to, to translate it um, correctly. But also um, there were these collations uh, which, which helped us really a lot. Plus in, um, in our subtitling tool, there is a forum where we can put questions in case we have doubts and other translators then answer them or insert what they think or how they understood the scene. So, that's more or less my answer to your question, if it's okay for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am very much aware of the, uh, of the time. Uh, so with your permission, I will just take one question from the, uh, the Q&A uh, section, and then I will ask the other participants to please type your, your questions in there. And Jana, I'm sure, will be more than happy to type the answers. But this question, again, it, it goes back to something that you referred, uh, that translating profanities is such an interesting thing. Did you choose to translate the severity of the swear words as opposed to translating them directly? 
Ah, that's a good question. And yes, we, I think, well, in most of the cases, we, we chose to, to translate them so that the level of the severity or the message is the same as in the Polish film, even though uh, since <laughs> there is such a big discrepancy between the use of swear words in Polish um, and in Slovak, um, that sometimes uh, it was difficult for us to know how severe are these Polish swear words? Are they, on, are they only a part of slang, like of a normal language? Uh, so, and as I mentioned, we had to cut them down on many places. Um, but I don't know if this answers the question of, uh, of the person who put um it. I hope so. I'm sure it does. Uh, so on, on these notes, I, um, I apologize. We, we have to finish here. Um, so we are going to take a relatively short lunch break um, and we will resume at uh, one o'clock um, when uh, we're going to have another, uh, another session with um, some uh, presentations from um, university representatives, uh, but also from, uh, from the industry. So thank you again. Thank you for your questions. Thank you to, uh, to the two presenters. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all after the break. Have a good lunch break, everyone. <laughs>